This is Monika Sawyer. Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Women, where we focus on all aspects of real estate investing, including strategies, mindset, emotional mastery, money smarts, and so much more to ensure your success. If you'd like to learn my personal favorite investing strategy, just go to blissfulinvestor.com. You can also listen to this episode on the Real Estate Investing for Women podcast on iTunes. Now, let's welcome our guest. Today, I am so excited to welcome back to the show, Matt Browning, my dear friend and mentor. Matt has been a writer for Forbes, is a two-time best-selling author and host of the top chart podcast, The Driven Entrepreneur on iTunes, and is syndicated on 16 AM FM stations coast to coast. He filmed in the movie The Journey with Brian Tracy and Bob Proctor, and you've seen him on television on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Matt has been an entrepreneur since 2002, speaking all over the world, including the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, and the U.K., and has shared his message at places like the Harvard Club, McAfee, New York Life, the NASDAQ Marketplace, and the United States Air Force Academy. He is an avid motorcycle rider, church leader, and rock climber. He resides in Grand Rapids, Michigan with his amazing, beautiful wife, Lola, and his awesome son, Valiant. Hey there! What's (laughs) happening, Monica? So I'm glad to be back. Let's make this happen. I can't wait for this conversation with you. Yeah, I always love our conversations, Matt. Not only do I get to share you with my friends, but I know I'm going to learn something amazing. So, hey, so, right back at you. Yeah. We're on the top real estate podcast for women. So, I'm looking to learn too. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, you know, Matt, I know you've been on the show before, but could you give us just a little bit of background of like kind of how, who you are and why you got started in NLP? Just like the two minute version. Sure. So, you know, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, it's sort of the, the, the programming of our own brains and our mindset, our subconscious mind. And I love this show in particular and you for this because I've only had two careers since I was 18 years old, not including Sizzler Steakhouse at 17. But since then, I have ran and owned my own real estate brokerage as well as being a real estate investor myself, getting to $5 million in property by 25. And I also turned away from the real estate world and decided to go in the coaching world and the speaking and training world because I just love the fulfillment of helping an individual transform and change their lives. And it's fun today. I love doing trainings at real estate companies, working with investors, because I understand sort of both sides of the mindset, but I also get the practical strategy because I use that in my life so much. Right. And that's exactly why I wanted you back on the show because you really bring a perspective from, of NLP to real estate. So um, I just absolutely love that. Let's start by actually defining NLP. Great question. I've gone sometimes in presentations for 20 minutes and somebody raises their hand and says, what is it called again? (laughs) I forget to define it. So it's such a a, a foundation for my life and and the business. Neuro linguistic program is what NLP stands for. And quite simply, it sounds fancy, but neuro is for the mind. Linguistic is for language. And programming represents sort of the, the programs that we already have running behind the scenes. Our mind is very much It's not a computer by any stretch of the imagination, but in a way it's like that as a metaphor where you have these programs running, cleaning up or or taking care of something. And sometimes I find that we have programs that run that really serve us. And sometimes we have forgotten programs. You know, those ones that we set up at five when we saw mom and dad fight over a checkbook and they said, hey, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, gosh, money must be, you know, the root of all evil. And I've heard that somewhere. So now, 30 years later, I'm somehow subconsciously trying to stay away from money, but consciously I want to have it. So that's an example of a program. So NLP is studying the programs that our mind runs, and ultimately, I believe, how to take charge of them again, how to take control back for your own subconscious mind. Mm, I love that. So a lot of times when people think of NLP, if they've even heard of it, they think about the guys on TV that manipulate people to do weird things, a lot like hypnosis, right? Because there's languaging patterns and stuff like that with NLP too. And so part of what, ladies, what I really want you to know is that why I found Matt, I have my own story. So I was a coach for about 12 years for executives. And I found that, you know, in a lot of the trainings that I had, I would implement 
my coaching practices and people would just say, would say, oh, Monica, that's just NLP. And I kept hearing that. And I thought, what in the world? <laughs> like, I had never taken an NLP training or whatever. And what I discovered is that through a lot of the coaching practices, but also through my life, NLP is simply kind of a categorization of things that we naturally do. Ways That's a that we, really, really good way to put that. Right? We naturally speak certain ways. We naturally connect with people in certain ways. And we naturally create programming in our own head. And one of the things that I think is so important to success is to living your life more consciously. So running your business more consciously, relating to your spouse more consciously. And so it was important to me that if I was already doing this thing, to be more conscious and purposeful about how I was doing it. So it would improve me, it would improve my relationships, it would improve my business. So that's where I went on my search for an NLP trainer. One of the things that I really loved about Matt is his heart. I really, I met a lot of NLP trainers. They were all about success and business and self-improvement and you know patterns and all of this stuff. But they didn't talk about the thing that was most important to me, which is this is really about connection, not manipulation. And I think that was a fear that I had about it. And so it was important to me to find somebody that really understood that connection piece. And Matt is one of those people. And one of the things that he talks about very early on in any of his courses about keeping it ecological. So Matt, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that, that is, if you've run into anyone who has tried to manipulate something and and there's there's very few if nlp was a tree you'll find a few twigs in the branches of the people that are out there trying to say hey this is a powerful communication tool mm -hmm. like any powerful tool the metaphor has been probably drilled into the ground at this point but you take a hammer and you can use a hammer as a tool to build something amazing i'm doing a renovation in my bathroom right now and i'm using a hammer a lot mm -hmm. but i flip the hammer around and i can use it to tear down and do all my demo too mm -hmm. so a great tool can be used for whatever your purpose is. So to me, the biggest question, it's not about NLP even, it's really about any industry that you get into. The question of manipulation is always there versus connection. And I think there's only one question to ask yourself is intent. So when you're working with someone, when you go to a car dealer, when you go to a dentist, when you go to an NLP practitioner, a coach, uh, a, a real estate salesperson, whatever it is, the question of what is their intention? Is the intention to serve, to connect, to give you what you want, and also I get what I want, and we have a mutually beneficial or ecological relationship? Or is my intent solely to take care of me? And worse, is my intent solely to take care of me at the expense of you, which I think is the ultimate level of not caring. And look, if that person with that kind of heart who doesn't really care and doesn't want to serve and just wants what they want at anyone's expense, if you give that person kryptonite, they turn into Lex Luthor, right? If you give that person a powerful tool, they're going to use that to get ahead. So I'm on a big mission in our NLP community and the entire, you know, I have a whole membership uh, group of people that love to practice ecological NLP. I want to get it to the hands of everybody. I want everyone in the world to understand it because if we do, if we all understand how to communicate deeper, more effectively, more intentionally, consciously, as you said, I think the world will be a better place. And imagine, Monique, if everyone knows the NLP language, quote, patterns that you know and that I know, then all of a sudden, if you do hear that random one in a thousand person, you know, trying to lay some pattern on you or whatever and manipulate a situation, you'll smell it a mile away and go, what are you talking about? Get out of here, you know? So I think keeping it, looking at the intention, you never have to worry about that. And if you are ever worried about manipulation, I think learning the skill set that you're worried about happening to you is one of the greatest ways, one of the greatest armors to tackle that in the world. I love that. Um, and I don't mean to say that other NLP trainers are not ecological also. There really are a lot of wonderful oh, people. Some of them there. are not. And That's many right. of them are, but some of them are not for sure. Right. Um, but what I really love about you specifically, Matt, is that we talk about this first. Like it's, it is this, the foundational piece of what you teach. Um, and I really love that. And one of the things that I will say about as a blissful investor, my relationships are key to everything that I do, right? My, my tenants are my business partners. My real estate agent is my real estate partner, right? So I've got a team of partners that help to grow my business. So our relationships are really, really important. And so those communications things become very 
critical to really building my business. Now, sometimes I'll say that to people and people are like, Monika, you know, if you're using patterns or whatever, you're being really manipulative. And I think that what's really important to understand is that there's a fine line between manipulation and connection. Because if, and it's like what you say, your intention, right? My intention is to be heard and to fully hear. And so if you can create a way to do that connection that feels naturally natural, there's more flow, then there's going to be a better understanding, rapport, and connection with that person. And you're likely to hear what their needs are much better also. So as I give this example with NLP. I lived in France for a year and a half. It was one of the most beautiful times of my life. And what was interesting is that when I first got there, I spoke French very poorly. So communication with the French was difficult. And then as I learned more Fran French, and I started to speak to people in French, now they became very interested in speaking to me and would automatically switch to English. So together, we found a way to communicate that allowed us to understand each other better. And I really feel like these NLP patterns are just that. It's another way for us to communicate in the other person's language so they understand us, and then they want to reciprocate that communication back. So that's really all NLP is. It's a very natural way of doing things. We do it naturally anyways, but if you can make it more conscious, you up-level your ability to communicate and build yeah. rapport. And not only up-leveling, but you, know, you talked about conscious, right? It's as if, think of NLP as, as recipes. You have a whole recipe book, and that's the catalog of behaviors. And, and there's, again, several areas of, of neurolinguistic programming. Some is language patterns. Some is state control. Some is understanding the process subconsciously of how we do what we do. There, there's some in sales, some in negotiation. We, we have NLP for public speaking. What it all comes down to, though, is imagine someone who bakes a phenomenal cookie, and you want to replicate that cookie over and over again because it's so good. But you ask them, how do you do it? And they go, I don't know. It seems like it's magic. Right? Grandma has just been making that cookie for 60 years and she has no idea really how she does it. She just puts a spring of this and a dash of that. And the NLP modelers, trainers like me, we come around and say, hang on, how is it that you do this thing? Is there, uh, like in therapy, was there a language pattern, certain patterns that all put together can really accomplish the change more effectively? We looked at presentation patterns and said, are, are there certain language and types of words and structures of wording, structures of sentences that are more emotionally impactful than not? And you take two communicators, one, they say the same thing, but one structures it a different way and it emotionally lands. The other person structures it however it comes out of the brain and it doesn't emotionally land. Going back to the metaphor of a recipe, Monica, imagine you have two people trying to make cookies. One makes cookies that taste too salty, one make perfect cookies. NLP is looking at the recipe and then saying, is it manipulative to say, I want you, I want to learn that recipe so that when I make cookies, everybody enjoys them. I want to learn the speaking recipe. So when I have a speech, my message that I intend to land lands, I want to learn NLP in my relationship communication so that when I look to my wife and try to express that I love her, she actually feels loved versus me doing it however I'm trying to do it. Does that make sense? It's all about the pattern and the recipe. So when you do it consciously, you can duplicate the result you want over and over again. And there's another side of NLP, which is actually also a good side, which is getting rid of the bad recipes. Mm -hmm. So if you have salty cookies, you can stop making those when you become aware of the pattern. Maybe you keep getting into conflict in relationship. You keep um, waking up late to your alarm clock, even though you want to get up and go to the gym. These are these patterns that are what I would call salty cookies. So you use NLP to a certain like scramble, rip up and destroy the recipe and replace it with a better one. That's all it comes down to for me. Right. And, and I loved your example at the very beginning when you were like, you see your mom and dad when you're five years old oh, yeah. arguing about money and you're like, oh my gosh, money is a bad thing. It makes people fight. And you suddenly have this little seed implanted, which then grows because here's the other thing, right? You'll notice is that the second you have a belief, you're going to find lots of things to support that belief, right? Yes. So now you got this seed planted. And so now you look for, out to the world for all these reasons why it's true. And your conscious mind is maybe fighting that, but you're, that's what your subconscious mind is doing. And so an opportunity with NLP is to take out that seed, to pull that weed, for instance, 
and instead plant a beautiful daffodil or something like that, right? Or a rose, right? So, <laughs> Look, a a garden? <laughs> well, no, but I love the metaphors. Let's go to that one. So a garden has everything, right? There, there's weeds and there's soil and there's worms and there's flowers and there's vegetables and whatever. There's everything. And oftentimes we will look based on our beliefs, as you said, we'll look at a garden and we'll see the weeds or we'll look at a garden and we'll see the flowers. And neither one of those are true. The world reality is actually so much more complex. And when, when you, excuse me, when you talked about um, whatever belief you believe, you're going to find a reference to make that true. There's an actual physiological, neurological reason that happens. Um, there's a great book. Um, I've talked about this on stage, but check it out if, um, if you've never heard this before. It's an old book called Flow, written by a Hungarian biologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. So you can put that in the show notes if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I you can even it. say that. <laughs> yeah. But if, you find, if you find a book named Flow with a long author, that's the one. And in there, uh, Professor Csikszentmihalyi says that there are 2.3 million bits of information coming into our awareness every second of every day. And if you get, that's a lot of bits. And that means that there's so much information coming in. So let's take twin brothers, random example. They come down the stairwell one morning and they see mom and dad fighting over the checkbook. They don't talk about it. They see what happened. They go back to their room and they go separate beds and they decide what that means. One brother decides that means that money is the root of all evil. We don't have enough money. So therefore I need to do whatever, or sorry, um, they're fighting over money. So I need to stay away from money. Money equals conflict and loss of love. The other brother saw the exact same information. He heard the same conflict, but he comes to a different conclusion. This brother believes that mom and dad aren't able to pay the bills. Therefore not having money is the worst thing in the world. I don't want to lose love and connection. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to make money. The first brother ends up far more poor than he expects himself to be. The second brother is maybe extra rich, does all the work, becomes successful. And look, maybe the successful brother is happy, maybe he's not. Maybe the poor brother is happy, maybe he's not. That's a whole other conversation. But when we see an example of something, when we experience an event, what does it mean? Humans are meaning-making machines, and that's really what we study in the field of NLP is how do we make those meanings and when you make a meaning that you don't want, how do you change it? And when you have a fresh experience, how do you make a meaning that you do want? Nothing's more important in life, I believe, than the meanings we give to events and the story we tell about those events, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to say to people that, you know, no matter what's happening in your world, um, you're making up a story about it. Why not make up a good one, right? <laughs> Um, and that's oversimplifying it, but it's basically that same thing is we have control over the message that we give ourselves about anything that's actually happening in our life. Yeah. The only challenge with the control is that most of the meaning we give is, is unconscious or subconscious meaning creation. Mm -hmm. So really, the, the, and this is what we talk about so much. We'll have these long conversations, Monica, about how to take back control of the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the problem is going back to those 2.3 million bits. If you have 2.3 million bits of information, that's like ultimate 4K TV, a thousand million channels, you know, all at once at the same time. Visuals, auditories, kinesthetics, feelings, experiences, street lights are going on, cars are out, people are walking, all this stuff's going on every second of every day. But we can only consciously process 126 out of 2.3 million. That is the equivalent of literally a needle in a haystack. So when we so our subconscious mind processes the haystack and finds a relevant needle. And I call that needle the meaning, right? That's the meaning, the narrative we give it. But how did you discern which was the needle you wanted to focus on? Well, your subconscious mind is very powerful. And that's the part of your mind that focuses on the meaning and finding it. After you found it, then we run around and go, well, this is just what I believe. This is just how the world is. This is relationships are hard. Relationships are easy. Men are this way. Women are that way. Whatever we believe, you know we just run with that. So NLP is really when you study it deeply, uh, we do this course in our membership community and, and pro just going through these, these, these studies in this process, we're wanting to uncover how did you make the meaning, not why, but how, and how do you take control back? Mm -hmm. So you give the means that you really want ultimately so you can do the things you want and feel the way you want to feel. <laughs> 
That's right. And that's what bliss is about, right? Is creating way these habits because eventually after you've learned it, like in the beginning, you have to really focus on it, right? But over time, it becomes this natural default way of being. You can catch it much more quickly, but you also do things that serve your subconscious much more naturally. Um, so then you're able to live more in bliss more frequently without the, the huge effort that it takes, right? Yeah, so, bliss is uh, your default setting. for it, like, like It really is. And, and I've talked about this with you for years. We've been friends for a long time. It, it's almost like, how, how does that happen? And you said default setting. I think it's really interesting because people wonder, how do I get bliss as my default setting? How do mm -hmm. I get peace? How do I get love as my default? How do I get forgiving as my default setting versus holding a grudge? Well, the secret is we always have a default setting. Yes, we do. It's like you already have it. If you love sushi, you don't have to keep figuring out if you love sushi every time someone says, do you want to have sushi? Your default setting is, I'm a sushi guy. I like sushi. And it's just as easy to have a default setting of, I hate sushi, it's disgusting, it's raw fish, bleh. So the question is, what's your default setting now? And I think the first step to getting an intentional, conscious default setting that you want is to figure out what your current one actually is. Because believe it or not, you have one, right? Mm -hmm. We all do. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's move into a little bit more real estate specific NLP. So, uh, yay. <laughs> and, um, so one of the biggest things that we do in um, real estate is building relationships. And in those relationships, we have to negotiate, we have to ha build rapport, we have to um, have conversations, right? And sometimes they're really difficult conversations. So talk to me about how we can use NLP specifically with those difficult conversations and with negotiation. Very good. So I have, uh, this is something that is one of my favorite topics because usually when you, when you think negotiation, it's almost always, and you have to, you have to quote unquote, win, win negotiation because the default setting is usually negotiation is back to that manipulation. How do I get what I want? Kind of a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't believe in that negotiation is simply put, I have a concept idea or desire, and it is different than your concept idea or desire. So how do we come together with the intention of finding an outcome that you agree with and I agree with, an outcome that serves you, an outcome that serves me, an outcome that gets as close to what you want and as close to what I want as possible. And that is, that's, so that's how I define negotiation. Okay, let's okay. find an outcome that we can both agree on even though our initial ideas are disparate, separate, they're not the same concept. Um, negotiation is not compromise. And this is a huge writer downer to understand. Compromise is where we meet in the middle. Meeting in the middle is one of the worst negotiation tactics in the world. It leads to some of the deepest dissatisfaction with outcomes. You know, consider a, a real simple, you make an offer on a house and let's just say the house is 250 and you offer 200. Well, the seller wanted 250. They feel like that's a real value. You want 200, you feel like that's a good deal. Meeting the middle means you say, how about 225? And we've said, I've heard this in real estate conversations, word for word. You know what, why don't we meet in the middle? Why don't we meet in the middle 225? What does that actually mean? It means the seller didn't get what they want and they feel like they sold it too cheap and the buyer didn't get what they want, they feel like they overpaid. So that's meeting the middle compromise is a lose-lose. Here's a simple metaphor for compromise. I'm really hot, which is normal in my house, and my wife is really cold, which is normal in our house, right? <laughs> and we're sitting in the same room together and I want the window open for the breeze. Now I want the window open because it's too hot. She says, no, it's, I'm cold, shut the window. What's compromise? Why don't we meet in the middle? Let's open the window halfway. What does that do? Now she's <laughs> breezy and it's still stuffy, right? So you're not really getting what you both want. So I say this, instead of trying to compromise, instead of meeting in the middle, what you need to do instead is, this is a term I use often, I'll explain it in a second, recover intention. Recover the intention. And you'll get that, Monique, because we've talked about this. But recovering the intention is like, I, I think sometimes in our behaviors and our desires, the intention behind the behavior, the intention behind the desire is lost. We don't know what it is consciously. We don't communicate what that is. I say, hey, can you close the window? We don't communicate that the intention for why I want the window closed is because I'm really cold. It's a simple thing, but we oftentimes in communication, we don't communicate our intention. We just communicate our desire or the behavior. Does that make sense so far? Absolutely. 
Yeah. So rule number one for negotiation is quit compromising and actually look for the intention. Look for what you're, want, you're both wanting. Rule number two is recover the intention. So whenever, I don't care what the situation is, whenever someone says, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what I'm looking for, this is my offer, you always ask the question, what's your intention for that? Another way to say it is, what's the purpose of offering this number? What are you wanting out of that? Why are you offering this number? Why is that the number you landed on? And I want to know. And the, the, the example I just gave to a, to a Remax office I was doing a training for just a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, we, I talked about the idea of like a, you know, termite reports. And this is a common thing that'll come up and, you know, not as much of a cash investment, but you know what I mean? The termite reports, you got to fix the fence. The fence is beat up. There's termites. The termite guy says, hey, you got to fix the fence. Now, what do we do? Well, the seller says, I don't want to fix the fence. That's not fair. We already agreed on the price. The buyer says, hey, I didn't know the, the fence was broken down. I think it's fair you fix the fence. And now you have this little detail of a $1,500 fence and this make or break it and the deal. And I've seen many deals in my time as a mortgage broker, as a real estate broker and an investor. I've seen them fall apart over something much smaller than that. But that's a really common one. I'm not willing to do the seller credit thing. So what you do is you start with recover the intention. The seller doesn't want to not fix the fence because they're a jerk. And the buyer doesn't want them to fix the fence because they're greedy. There's an intention behind it, right? And maybe the intention is, I don't want to fix the fence because I'm already tapped out and we thought we were going to net this much money and now it's really about the cash. Maybe though, that's not. People always assume it's money. It's not always money, especially in real estate. Sometimes I don't want to fix a fence because I feel like I've already done so many repairs to the house that I feel like it's just too much. I've already made it nice. And it's a but, feeling they get. Uh, right. There's also this thing, right? Like it's the principle of it. And, and that's what I mean. What's yeah, the that's that feeling of I've just done enough, right? Yeah. I had one, actually the house we live in right now, when we were negotiating this um, about a year ago, it was a real small little thing. But we had two things happen that the deal changed. The first one was the appraisal came in less. Now I went in, I said, hey, willing to pay you top dollar, very happy, I like this house, we wanna live here. And then the appraisal came in short. So I said, hey, we wanna pay you top dollar, but it turns out top dollar is actually this much, not, you know, it's a little bit less. And we talked about it and I think we had a good negotiation and it seemed fair. They liked it and they thought, you know what, we're still getting the very top of the market for this but I still felt good because coming from California to Michigan, I think houses are 70% off. So I didn't care. I felt like it was a good deal <laughs> and it's gone <laughs> up since then. So it's fine. But then a second thing happened and then we had the inspection and we went back and said, Hey, this, this, this are not functioning properly. And we really would like it to be fixed. The principle they felt when we uncovered the, the intention was I already feel like I gave you something and now you're asking for more. So they didn't want to do it because they thought we were being greedy. What did we do? Well, I communicated and I communicated our intention. And I said, listen, I feel like these are two different things. And, you know, we want to pay you the top dollar we promised based on the appraisal. And that is that. When it comes to the repairs, we're not looking for anything over and above. My intention is that we get a fair deal. And I know that you want to sell a house at a fair deal too. And what happened is we both found the same higher intention, if that makes sense. We landed on the fact that they want to be fair people and we want to be fair people. And as simple as it is, that went so far to use the language. And this is where NLP comes in, the language pattern itself. I kept coming back to you, no matter how detailed we got on the concessions and what's the price and I want $50 for this or $2,000 for that or whatever it is, we always made sure I wrapped it in the package of, and remember, I just think what the fair thing to do would be this. I think it would be fair to split this cost down the middle. I, now, I feel like if I was in your shoes, the fair thing to do would be this. And as long as we kept the intention alive, so to speak, of we're looking for fairness, they agreed on fairness, we agreed on fairness. And then the only question is, well, what is exactly fair? And then, hey, sometimes you don't get what you want. Sometimes you, like, I'll decide to give because I go, honestly, if I want to be fair, maybe we shouldn't ask for that extra dollar, you know, and it's fair to do this for the person. And what you find is you don't get as much of what you want, quote unquote, but you'll find better deals. You'll be a, a better human, a better investor, a better partner, a better seller. Um, ultimately, more wins happen and you get to 
you get to play the game. You know, I talk a lot about uh, playing the games and winning games. And, you know, you know how, uh, what we say, Monica, it's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. And that couldn't be more truthful because how you play the game of negotiation isn't about winning and losing. It's literally about how did you play that game? Because if I play the game well, I will win more than I lose. And hopefully there won't even be losers. And most importantly, and I'll end with this is when you play the game well, you get invited to more games. Mm. You know, I mean, I quoted that's from Jordan Peterson, a, a really interesting professor who talks about the game of life. And when you get invited to more games, that means someone thought, hey, I got a really great deal from this investor and they took care of me. And then all of a sudden they send your, their uncle and they say, you should talk to Monica too. She, you know, got me out from under this house that was a burden and, you know, it was a fair deal. And all of a sudden you get a bigger deal because of that. And then you get the referrals and, and you start to play more games. Mm -hmm. And life's about playing more games, not about trying to win the one little one you have. The other thing that I really like about the way that you present this is, so you're finding some mutual ground and some mutual intent. And that mutual intent, intent allows you to see the very best in the other person, which then brings that out in them. It also allows you to really plug into the very best in yourself, and then that person comes forward. So with the game analogy, you know, if you're just a really fun, you know, like my husband and I play board games all the time. I always lose. He always wins. <laughs> but the reason we keep playing is because he's really fun to be around when we're playing. So he's so, fun when he wins and you're fun when you lose. Right. And if it turns around, then it's fun the other way too. But the thing is this, that we bring out the very best in each other during that process because it's fun for us. We have a common intention, right? And when you're negotiating, remember that it's you that's showing up for that. And if you allow the other person to be the very best person and you allow yourself to be the very best person, it feels much more blissful for everybody which is Very the, true. The, the end result that we're really looking for, right? Yeah. Um, and maybe and, real quick, I could share this one last negotiation key I think would be really useful there if we mm -hmm. have time for that. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you give a metaphor or an example of like playing board games with your husband, mm -hmm. that's, it's really easy to see that, you know, you know, you can get worked up in like, you know, in couples games. It's pretty easy to all of a sudden monopoly. It feels like it's the end of the world and it feels like th there's nothing more important than you cheated or that that's no, the rule is you can't roll three times. You have to pay. And then it's my turn. It's not, you know, get out of jail. And we can get uh, like really bogged down in this little rule as if, and what happens is this, the game feels bigger than it is. Right. And so the rule for negotiation is this game is never what it's about. Right. There's always, so write this down. If you're writing things down, there's always a bigger game and life is the bigger game. So if I'm in the middle of negotiating like this house, you know what, if we made an extra 2000 or lost 2000, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, at the end of our life, more than end of the day, there is a much bigger game I'm playing. And if I really want to win at real estate, I can't just win from one house. And you know that you're going to win from many rental properties or many flips or many combination of these, or you want to work your way from residential to multifamily or commercial. There's something you're doing that there's a broader game. So remember when you negotiate that, is this the hill you want to die on this one thing? And sometimes it makes more sense to go, you know what? I pick relationship over rules and I'm keeping the relationship with this person. I'll give up the thousand dollars because I'm playing a bigger game right? It's when, and I hate the metaphor of the battle or the war, that's not really where I'm going, but it's, there's a bigger game in life here. And if I want to succeed at life and I want to succeed long-term, there's a much bigger game. And this is just monopoly. It's just a Wednesday night family game. So what if the rule was broken, let it go. My wife is more important than whether or not the rule says this. And that's what we got to remember is this game will not last, but the big game does. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just love that. So one of the things that I'd really love to do, Matt, if you're open to this, is we're going to be moving into extra in a few minutes. And I'd love for you to walk us through a few of these patterns on maybe mindset or um, negotiation or something like that. Does that sound like fun to you? Does it sound like fun? <laughs> I mean, it's a game. Of course it's going to be fun. <laughs> Let's <Yay>! do it. <laughs> Let's so ladies, <laughs> so ladies, stay tuned for extra because Matt is going to share some
over these patterns with us so that we can become more default blissful and um, play the game better in our life. So that'll be really awesome. But before we move on to that, Matt, could you tell everybody how they can reach you? Oh, thank you so much. And, and I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. I always love connecting with you, Monica, and um, you know everyone listening. So if, you, if this was relevant to you and you'd like to learn a little bit more about NLP, what this thing really is, I decided to make a really, really simple uh, gift for everybody, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, if you head over to nlpwithmatt.com, that's my name, <laughs> nlpwithmatt.com, um, instead of giving some kind of a template or some kind of a report on something, I just decided, what if I gave everybody interested in NLP and furthering the conversation a complete and total NLP practitioner manual? So this is a 74 page color manual that I use for my advanced certification trainings. So I took the whole course manual and just give you the whole thing. So you can look from A to Z and learn everything about what NLP is from language patterns to state management to mindset, all of it and then some is all in the manual. It's nlpwithmatt.com, best place to go. And then I'm Matt Browning, B-R-A-U-N-I-N-G. You can follow me anywhere on social at Matt Browning. Instagram, I put all, uh, memes and family and fun clips and things like that on there. But yeah, nlpwithmatt.com. If you want the free manual, it's right there for you. Enjoy. Yay. Thank you. That's so generous. I love that. Thank you, Matt. Hey, me too. That's the kind of, re <laughs> that's the kind of response I want to get, you know, if I give way, way too much, then it's just enough. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. So are you ready for our three rapid fire questions? I'm ready. Okay, so Matt, give us one super tip on how to be successful in real estate investing. One super tip is act immediately. And I think when I look back in my early career, I ordered this uh, 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 home study from Carlton Sheets, the no money down, so like, no money down. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, I never used his method exactly, but it got me motivated and I realized why am I still waiting for the perfect time so the principle I learned from Carlton Sheets wasn't about no money down. I actually put money down, but I decided to purchase. I said, I'm going to get out there and look for something. And I found this five unit place in Long Beach, California. I bought it and sold it four months later and I made $180,000 profit. And I did that, I think 23 years old. And I share that story not to impress you, but to impress upon you that concept of start now because there's never a better time than now besides yesterday. <laughs> I love that. And then give us one strategy on how to be successful in real estate investing. Okay, so here's the opposite side of it. Um, stop and think things through. It's easy and I, I, I'm a, a big, uh, in life languages, it's called a mover, um, Enneagram number seven. Uh, you know, I'm like this, this guy who when I get a feeling of like motivation, just go. You know, if I want new patio furniture and I feel motivated, I go to the store that day and I want to get it home today. So if you're like me, the other side is start acting and go after it. But then when you get the deal, when you get an opportunity in front of you, really stop, really think. If you don't normally work the numbers, work the numbers backwards and forwards. Send it through to a friend that knows what they're doing to really hash it out with you. And it's not the end of the world if you say no to an opportunity. Stop and think things through and lay the emotion down. You'll stop a lot of dumb mistakes. Mm, so good. And then what would you say is one daily practice that you do, Matt, that contributes to your personal success? That's such a good question. And it's, it's changed over the years a lot. You know, it used to be the standard, oh, I, I read this or I meditate or I journal. What it is now for me, as I get busier, is always making sure that every day I find a way to create moments with my family. So I have my wife, Lola, of 10 years and our nine-year-old son, Val, and we all live at home together, of course, um, especially during the year 2020, we've been at home more than we probably ever have before when my traveling stopped. And what I try to do is even, you know, today we're doing, this is interview day. So on my podcast, Driven Entrepreneur, I'm doing a lot of interviews. Uh, I'm blessed to be on your show. And during these times, I'm up in my office kind of all day. So in between the, my last interview and this one right now, I had, Hey, I got 20 minutes. So I went downstairs and I grabbed my son and I'm thinking, how can I create a moment out of these extra five, 10 minutes? Not just, can I sit on the couch and talk to him for 20 minutes, but how do I make a moment in my spare time? If every day you can look back and say, what was the one outstanding magic moment for myself with my creator, myself with my family, myself with my friends, whatever it was, 
you're going to look back at a week of seven magic moments minimum, and you're going to feel like you had a great week. I've never heard anybody say it quite that way. Bam. I That's just, why we're friends. Yeah. No, I just love that because I think it's true. You know, Dave and I have date nights every week and that's our, you know, it's our sacred time. We've been doing this for 26 years. Um, but it is true that during the week, like I've got a day like you, I've got interviews all day long. I've got 20 minute breaks in between. Yep. And I feel like I need to scramble instead of thinking, what can I do for five minutes that would create um, something magical for me. And what's beautiful about that is it, it helps the relationship. It also uplifts both of us to then perform at our very best wherever we're going next, right? So I just love that. I'm going to implement that. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, this has been an amazing conversation as always. Thank you for joining us for this portion of the show. Hey, I can't thank you enough. It's always a pleasure being with you, Monica. Any time, any bat time, any bat channel, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. And ladies, stay tuned. Matt's got more. He's going to actually go into some of those patterns to try to change your paradigm during the show. That's going to be on Extra. So stay tuned. If you are already subscribed to Extra, and if you're not, but would like to be, go to Real Estate Investing for Women Extra. Dot com. That's real estate investing for women extra.com. And when you subscribe, you get seven days for free. So you get to kind of download a ton of stuff that's already there. Check it out. And then you can subscribe if you like to. And the really cool thing is that once you're subscribed to extra, it will show up wherever you are listening to this podcast. Now you don't need any new apps. You don't need any new tech. It'll just show up right there for you. So super easy real estate investing for women extra.com. For those of you who are leaving us now, thank you so much for joining Matt and I for this portion of the show. You know how much I appreciate you, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, remember, goals without action are just dreams. So get out there, take action, and create the life your heart deeply desires. I'll see you next time. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to download my favorite investing strategy, just go to blissfulinvestor.com. See you next time.